physicist with Brisbane firm Rome Consulting, providing advice to industry and government on climate change policy and renewable energy. His PhD was researching the role of phys physics in biology, including possible applications of biology to solar cells. Dr. Joel's here today to pose the question, all you need is nuclear. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Joel Gilmore. I for one am going to revel in this moment. It's the best talk moment I've got. That's great. Um, so thank you very much. Today I have the perhaps dubious honour of talking to you about nuclear power. And once my slides come up, I am going to open with a quote. Opposition to nuclear energy is based on irrational fear, fed by Hollywood-style fiction, the green lobbies, and the media. Now, this is a pretty bold statement, and potentially a very risky way to begin a presentation. But the real question is, who said it? Is it the head of a multinational uranium mining company, an evil overlord, the same thing? In fact, it was said by James Lovelock, an award-winning environmentalist and staunch campaigner against climate change. Now, my point here is that if somebody who is as committed to the environment and climate change as James Lovelock says this, then perhaps we need to at least talk about it. So my goal in this session is only one thing, and that is to start us having a discussion about nuclear power. There are definitely arguments against nuclear power, but there might also be arguments for nuclear power. I myself don't know where I stand on nuclear power. And I would hope that you don't know yet either. So let us then kick off from Lovelock and think about some of the objections to nuclear power and where they come from. I would be as bold as suggest that some of the opposition comes from the word nuclear itself. When we say nuclear, what's the first thing you think of? Is it clean nuclear power or is it nuclear bombs, Iran, Iraq, uh, North Korea? In medicine, the real name for an MRI used to be NMRI, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. But that was changed because of people's negative response to the word nuclear. Now, yes, reactors use nuclear fuel, but in the case of a, a typical reactor today using uranium fuel, it is actually safe enough to handle without any special shielding, at least until it's been used. So I guess all I want to say on that one is that we shouldn't let something as simple as a word sway our decisions. And that's something we need to think about. The next issue that often comes up is safety, that somehow nuclear reactors are incredibly unsafe. In fact, I would argue that nuclear reactors are one of the safest technologies in the world. Now, if you actually look, this is a chart of the actual data. This is a study looking at the deaths from per kilowatt energy from all the different power sources, taken over the entire life, construction, mining, accidents, whatever. What you can see is that nuclear is right down the bottom. In this study, it came out slightly more dangerous than hydro, slightly less dangerous than wind power. Compare that to coal, which is incredibly dangerous. Now, all that's saying, I mean, you should take this with a grain of salt. There's obviously error bars here. But nuclear power is not, when you look at the facts, dangerous. Now, of course, at this point, we have to mention Chernobyl. Because here, the reactor actually exploded. Surely, could that happen to other reactors as well? Well, Chernobyl is not representative of nuclear power at large. The Chernobyl reactor was a Russian-designed reactor that had known design and safety flaws. It had very few of the safety systems of similar reactors in the US and none of the advanced safety systems of modern reactors. And so it's not really a good comparison to make. But even beyond that, Chernobyl killed 4,000 people predicted from cancer and radiation-related deaths. And I, that's truly a terrible disaster. But when a hydroelectric dam collapsed in China in 1975, it killed 
100,000 people, the resulting flood and famine and disease. So again, we have this sort of risk aversion specifically to nuclear power. And I don't want to underestimate the importance of safety and how we have to be vigilant. But in terms of the outcomes, safety is not really an argument against nuclear power, any more than it's an argument against wind power. The next one, though, is a bit trickier, nuclear waste. What we're talking about here is the high-level waste from a nuclear plant that remains highly radioactive for tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Now, with appropriate reprocessing, recycling of fuel, we can probably cut that down to one or two thousand years that we need to store it for. But this is still a long-term problem that we, need, that we are leaving to our next generation and generations to come. To me, that's the biggest argument, or one of the biggest arguments against nuclear power, and it's a hard one to deal with. But at the same time, we need to keep things in perspective. If you, let's just take an example, let's say that 20% of your power came from nuclear energy. Over your entire life, the amount of nuclear waste you would produce would fit in this bottle. High level waste that would need to be stored long term. Now, if you compare that to how much waste you produce every year, hundreds of kilos of regular waste and hazardous waste, is this really an insurmountable problem compared to some of the other problems we're facing? Um, and of course, there's also the point that the next generation of nuclear reactors, the so-called fast breeder reactors, um, they're going to be able to use this waste actually as a fuel to generate more power. And they'll actually burn up a lot of the fuel, most of it. Uh, and so that's part of the reason why we currently store nuclear waste above ground rather than burying it forever, in the hope that we will be able to use this waste in the future. And there's some really exciting things going on with this fourth generation reactors. Um, Bill Gates is doing a lot of work with it. Uh, did a TED talk just recently. And so and these reactors will be safer and cheaper than existing technology. So there's, there's exciting things there, and we shouldn't you know, rule that out as a, as a sticking point. But I agree, it's a big one. And the final issue leading on from that is fuel supply. How much fuel do we actually have, uranium? And again, this is, this is not an easy question. At current predicted growth levels of nuclear power, there's probably about 70 to 80 years of uranium. Now, in some sense, that's not a lot. It's not a very big number, although it does go up if you start reprocessing, recycling the fuel, or if you just start paying more for your uranium so you can access harder to reach resources. Um, and plus, once we start using fast breeder reactions, that number goes out to hundreds of years. It's not a sustainable technology. It's not renewable in that long-term sense. But it might give us the time that we need to respond to some of the other challenges we face. So there are other issues as well, nuclear prol proliferation, water supply. Um, but to me, uh, those are not insurmountable issues. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about those afterwards. Um, the key thing here is that of these, the only one that I would consider perhaps a sticking point, a deal breaker maybe, would be the nuclear waste. But surely if you're talking about deal breakers, what you need to consider is what's on the other side of the scale? Why might we need nuclear power? Australia's population is growing. And by 2050, it's going to double, which means that by 2050, we're going to need twice as much electricity as we currently use. Now, that would be a challenge in and of itself. But more than that, our emissions are going to keep rising as well if we do nothing. And we know, despite what the Green Blob in the previous show said, that if we don't act, then we are going to be, scientifically speaking, screwed. Um, and so we need to consider ways of instead reducing our emissions by at least 80% from current levels while doubling our electricity. So what do we do? We have many options. The first is nuclear power. Nuclear power has a lot of advantages. It's a lot of energy in a small space. It has zero carbon emissions. It is uh, able to provide reliable 24-7 power. Um, there are currently 440 or so reactors operating around the world, with Asia constructing several more and more planned over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, Obama is pushing nuclear agenda in the States. Um, so there's definitely a lot of benefits of nuclear power. But of course, it's not the only fish in the sea. We have renewables. 
the intermittent renewables we currently use, like wind or solar. Now, these renewables generally thought there are limits to how much we can put in. Wind power only operates on average 30% of the time. So you would need three times as many wind farms as you would nuclear power stations for the same energy. There's also issues of reliability. Wind power only provides about 10% of its power when you need it most on hot days. Um, but they'll definitely be part of the solution, but just probably not the whole picture. So therefore, we're also exploring more advanced renewables, things like solar thermal with storage of solar power and enhanced geothermal power that can provide renewable energy 24-7. Now, these definitely have a lot of potential, but they're also still fairly experimental technologies. Geothermal, particularly, is at least 10 years, probably 20 away on that advanced scale. We have no commercial enhanced geothermal plants or even pilot plants. The, best exact, the, the closest plant is geodynamics in southern Australia, and they suffered a small explosion last year. Um, so there are definitely problems here. Um, the other tack that we're uh, looking at is carbon capture and storage. Continuing to burn coal and gas, but capturing those CO2 emissions, liquefying them and storing them underground in, say, depleted gas fields. Um, again, this holds a lot of promise, and Australia is putting a lot of money into it, given our coal reserves, for better or worse. Um, and it definitely holds promise, but it's still 20 years away. Maybe 15, maybe 10, but probably 20. And it hasn't really been tested on that large scale. So how do we decide what technology to pursue? Well, one question would be resource. Australia is incredibly lucky. We have a whole lot of coal. We have a whole lot of sunshine, a lot of wind, and a large share of the world's uranium. So other countries are not so lucky, and they may be a lot limited. They might have very little choice in what they install. Which is, of course, why Asia with the high population densities is going for a lot of nuclear. But in Australia, that's not an argument. What about costs? Well, let's have a look. This chart shows the cost in cents per kilowatt hour of various electricity sources. Current electricity comes from coal and gas and averages around the 40 to 50, uh, 4 to 5 cent mark. One thing you can see is that all these zero emission sources are much more expensive. Wind is four times as expensive as coal. These bars show a range of prices over the next 10 to 20 years. It might be higher, it might be lower, but this is sort of a reasonably good range. The schedulable renewables and also solar PV are all sitting on the right-hand side of this bar at the moment, but are hopefully coming down. Coal with CCS, we don't really know because there's no plants operating, but this is sort of the range that's expected. And nuclear, well, we have some fairly good estimates from looking at other countries and recent reactors. It's somewhere in this range here. Now, what that says is at the very least, there is no economic argument against nuclear power based on what we currently know. It's in the ballpark. At the best, it could be a lot cheaper than our other options. At worst, a little bit more expensive, but it's in there. Um, so economics is not really an argument. What about, you know, ethics? Well, I guess there's the issue that, you know, we'd like to be sustainable in long term. We want to invest money to support the renewable industry. Um, coal, with CCS, you're storing that CO2 forever, not just a thousand years, say, for nuclear waste. Maybe that's an argument away from CCS towards nuclear. Maybe not. Gas stays in the ground for millions of years. So that's sort of, we know it can work. So for me, then, I think a lot of the argument comes down to values and risk management. Let's consider a couple of simple scenarios. Let's say we have the choice of either building nuclear power or not. Now, we could, in principle, have a nuclear reactor up and running by 2020. France did it in seven years from deciding they wanted nuclear to switching it on. It would be an incredibly ambitious timeline. 2025 is probably a lot more realistic, despite what some of the pro-nuclear people would tell you. Um, but it's that sort of time frame. So it's available at least on the timeline as other renewables. So let's assume, first of all, that those other technologies, CCS, geothermal, are available, and we build nuclear power starting now. We have then wasted effort on nuclear. We didn't need it. On the other hand, if we don't build nuclear and these technologies become available, then we're safe. And probably this is the best outcome, right? We have a world with supported by renewables. 
There might be issues of cost, it might cost a lot more, but it's ethically speaking probably a good outcome. But let's consider the other option, that those technologies do not become available in time, or that climate change accelerates even quicker. If we build nuclear, you could probably call this the few state. You know, it's a good thing. I mean, yes, we have the nuclear waste, but we stop climate change. If, however, we don't build nuclear, then that could be called, well, I won't say the word, but you get the idea. Um, so some of this comes down to risk management and values. If you think that um, this outcome is terribly bad, and you don't want to risk destroying the planet from climate change, or at least our society, then the only choice is to build nuclear. If, however, you think that nuclear waste is an insurmountable problem, or you think that we're very certain to have these other technologies available, then you might decide to go with the don't build nuclear and risk this state with a very low probability, but most likely get this good outcome. In which case, you just have to acknowledge that you are taking a small but potentially real risk. At the end of the day, all of this comes down to an evaluation of risks, costs, and benefits, and how you value those different costs. And that's something that I can't say for you how to value things, only how I currently think. So I guess my, my, my main argument here is there are arguments, there are very good arguments against nuclear power but there are also arguments for nuclear power. And so we as a community, as a country, need to have a discussion about nuclear power. And we need to have it without fear, without you know, scare tactics. And I say discussion, not debate. In this and in so many other things, there should not be two sides that are arguing and saying that the other is gonna destroy the future of our children. There should only be people collaborating together, working to understand the different conclusions you could, destroy, that you could draw from hopefully the same data. We need to be proactive. We need to be engaged. And I think that the issue of climate change, Australia's energy future, and as bold to say, as the sustainability of our way of life is so important that we can't afford to dismiss any ideas without, keep it, without giving them full consideration. I firmly believe that we have the, have the power to, not, to make not just the right decision, but the best decision. And what better place to do it than starting here at TED today. Thank you.